and open with us to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we want to read verses 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 13. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people <coughs> sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. What we want to look at this evening is five examples of temptation uh, that he mentions here in our text. He says in verse 6, these things uh, were written as examples to us to the intent uh, that we should not fall into the same temptations and mistakes that the children of Israel uh, fell into. These things were recorded to admonish us and as examples to us, he says, not to do evil. And so we want to look at these uh, this evening uh, and touch upon each of these and the historical accounts as to when they occurred and then uh, bring it to the conclusion that Paul does here and the application he says we should not lust after evil things as they lust one of the things he brings out here and this is a warning to us as believers uh, or at least those who have made a profession of faith and, and we constantly it seems emphasize that distinction between those who merely have made a profession of faith and those who are genuinely saved and born again. And Paul is pointing out here that all the people, they came out with Moses, uh, they passed it under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were baptized with Moses. They all did eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. Uh, and yet, it was these same people, many of whom were overthrown in the wilderness and were guilty uh, of these things. And so we need to, as he says here, uh, beware and be on guard, take heed. He said that they should not lust after evil things. Well, what evil things is he talking about? Well, in Numbers chapter 11, Verses 4 through 6. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. 
and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And so what we see here that they were lusting after, he says, lusting after evil things. As we look upon the children of Israel, as God brought them up out of Egypt, it is used as a type of how people are saved, that Egypt is a type of the world, and it's a type of the life that we had before we were saved, uh, as Paul describes there in, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, how that uh, before we were saved, they... We lived according to the course of this world and so on. That's what Egypt represents. And then God had brought them out, but all they had to eat, God fed them. I mean, it, it was miraculous. It may not have been cordon bleu, but it was there every day for them to just pick up. They didn't have to cook it. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have to plow. They didn't have to sow. They didn't have to reap. Uh, God provided for them every day, the manna. And it was healthy for them. It sustained them. It was what they needed. But they were thinking, yeah, they got tired of it. I mean, if you eat the same thing day after day, you are going to get tired of it. And they got to going back in their minds and remembering all the things that they had in Egypt. Now, they were slaves in Egypt. They cried out in, in their... A bondage there and cried out to be delivered and God delivered them but now in their mind somehow that slavery didn't seem so bad and they began to desire again the old life or what they remembered of it and so we need to be careful you know uh, come to church day after day and you hear the word of God preached and and so on. And sometimes after a while, I say, well, I've heard that before, and I've heard that before, and it's the same old thing, Sunday after Sunday. And you get to think about all the entertainment, all the different things in the world that you used to go do, you the, the dances and the parties and all of this, and you begin to want to go back and do that again. You want some of that excitement, whatever. You know, you forget how the, at the time when God brought you under conviction for sin and you repented and you wanted out of that life, you want God to deliver you from that life and, and, and you wanted that salvation that He offered you and you uh, accepted that and the life that goes with it and He feeds you day after day after day from His Word. I mean, this is the only menu we have. And you got 66 books to choose from. And this is the menu that we have to feed upon, is His Word. You know, they, uh, they looked at that manna, they first saw it. They said, what is it? That's what manna means. What is it? Well, it's the food. Now, Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus was a hunger, he had fasted for 40 days, 40 nights there in the wilderness, and Satan came and tempted him. Notice, he tempted him. Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. And so sometimes we will be tempted also. And he said, If thou be the Christ, if you're hungry, you could turn these stones into bread. Verse 4, Jesus answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, this is our food. This is what we're to live upon is the word of God. Uh, Galatians chapter 4. Verse 8 and 9, he says, How be it then 
When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? And so here we get the idea too, uh, it, it's not just the food, it's not just the Word of God, but all of the ideas, the philosophies of this world, the, the thinking of this world, you know, we walked according to the course of this world. And he says, and when you didn't know God, you did service to those things. That's where you went to. I mean, that was your source of information. That, that's what shaped your attitudes and ideas about life and the world and the afterlife and whatever. He said, but now that the Lord has saved you, and you know Him, rather are known of Him, so why do you desire to go back to those, he calls them weak and beggarly elements? You know, when compared to the Word of God, when compared to the Holy Spirit, these are weak and beggarly elements. Why would you want to go back to them and that old life? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul admonishes Timothy, you know, said, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Like I said, now this is the only menu we have. This is the only thing that He's given us. This is what we're to preach. Uh, he said, preach the Word. Verse uh, 2, said, preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Repeat, re excuse me, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Now, use it. Preach the Word. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. You know, the worldly philosophies and things, those weak and beggarly elements, the time will come, he says, he won't. If they're not really rooted and grounded in the truth, the time will come. That they, in their minds and hearts, they'll turn back to Egypt. They'll turn back to the world. And they will desire, uh, again, to feast upon those worldly things. And that's why he's talking about here when he says uh, that we're not to lust after evil things. The things of this world. The old life. Its philosophies. Its teachings. And he says, neither be idolaters, as some of them were. In Exodus chapter 32, Sister Joyce has been reading, had some questions about this, and, uh, and I had to chuckle when I was doing the, the study for this, that uh, part of this landed me back in that very thing that she was had some questions about. I'm not going to be able to go into all that, but Exodus 32, 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, people gathered themselves together to, unto Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him, or we don't know what has become of him. You know, Right there, this man that brought us up out of Egypt. A man didn't bring them up out of Egypt. God brought them up out of Egypt. And that should have been rather obvious because he used Moses. But Moses didn't turn the waters to blood. God did. Moses didn't cause the locusts or the frogs or any of those other plagues. I mean, he was instrumental. He was used of God. He was kind of out there in front to warn uh, Pharaoh and to speak to Pharaoh. But Moses didn't cause any of that. Moses didn't cause the death of the firstborn throughout Egypt. God did. But you see, they're thinking. You know, 
Paul in Ephesians talked about we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Our problem is not with people. But how many times do you see people get to focusing on people? People are the problem. No, people are not the problem. Well, in some respects, people are the problem. But the problem is not in somebody else. The problem is in you. It's in me. Their problem was they left God out of the equation. They thought, well, anyway, as for this Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. They said, make us gods. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in the ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. You know, we, we always laugh when Moses is questioning him. Like Aaron says, Well, I collect all this gold and I threw it into the fire and out jumped this golden calf. That's what it sounds like. Um... Uh, but here we see he gravened it with a tool and fashioned it. Uh, after he had made a molten calf and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel. Now, and in reading this, one of the things we, it wasn't Aaron saying to the people, These be your gods. It was the people who came to Aaron and said, Make us gods. And when he made them, they are the same ones that turned around and said to the rest of the people, These be your gods. Yeah. Uh, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation, said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now, you cannot mix the worship of a golden calf with the worship of the Lord. You cannot mix the worship of idols with the worship of God. And this is what Paul Discusses. We didn't read that far, but this is what he gets into in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, the, the cup of blessing which we bless, this is the fellowship, you know, the communion with the blood of Christ and the bread that we break, this is the fellowship with the body of Christ. You cannot uh, partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. So the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. God doesn't receive that. He's not glorified by that. <clears throat> um, and they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play now we, we know this is what he's talking about what Paul's talking about in Corinthians because he quotes that part of it so that people can in their mind they know which particular incident he's talking about they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play uh, they rose up to play. They were not playing basketball. They were not playing badminton. It was uh, the idea of the fornication and, and all that went with the idol worship. This was the uh, in Egypt and many of these countries the, the temple worship involved uh, this kind of activity and they were just engaging in this idol worship to the hilt. And, uh, and so we see what happened to them there. Uh, and as we said in 1 Corinthians in our text, verse 14, it said, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Uh, so I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, and the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, that is through faith we're all partakers of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we observe the Lord's Supper in that picture, we are all partakers of that same sacrifice. And that goes back to his original illustration leading into this. All of them that came up out of Egypt, they all went through the same experiences. But with some of them, God was not well pleased. And so he's rebuking them here. 
uh, said, Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? He said, But I say that these things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And so any kind of false worship, uh, false teaching, um, you know, we need to be aware of. We need to kind of go back to the old landmarks and things about the fellowship and communion joining and communion joining and fellowship joining in with organizations. Now, and again, when we talk about churches and other denominations and things, there are saved people, love the Lord, doing, uh, to the uh, light that they have of serving the Lord. But that institution, that organization of which they are a member is not a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the worst of them, of course, is the Catholic Church. And we've shown how that they have incorporated idolatry and uh, idol worship and Baal worship and all these other things into their actual services and rites and, and the things that they do. And what he is saying is that as a child of God, you can't go and worship there and then come back and worship in your church and think that's pleasing to God. Uh, we ought not to partake because those who go and sit and partake of those services are identified, he says, with that altar, with what is being offered up there and what's being practiced there. And these things are offered to idols. You know, it, it'd be nice, you might be curious, and I wonder what they do in a Buddhist temple. Go in and sit down and observe their services. But somebody sees you going in and doing that to satisfy your curiosity or, you know, uh, even... So, well, they teach some good things. Well, they, all of them teach something that you might find compatible with Christianity. But uh, so you cannot, verse 1, drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Jeremiah 10 he says, learn not the way of the heathen. The way of the heathen is vain. Do not incorporate heathen practices into the worship of God. And he talks about idolatry. And it is vain. And then Jesus in Matthew talks about they, in vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. So, you know, it's not just one thing but this whole idea of taking the teachings and the doctrines of men and the worship of God and trying to mix them together, uh, it, it doesn't work. It's not pleasing to the Lord. He said, neither let us commit fornication in our text. Now in Numbers chapter 25, go back over there. Uh, and the, sometimes we have the idea that those that call themselves God's people are the purest, the most saintly people in the world. In reality, when you go through the scriptures, you go through history, you find some of them that profess to be Christians, profess to be God's people, are some of the meanest people in the world. I mean, you, it, just everything that you associate with being evil and, and worldly and, and wicked and sinful, you find, as you watch the children of Israel, just the 40 years they were in the wilderness, much less... The time later uh, when in the kingdom when they come into the land and all the idolatry and all the wickedness and, and all the things that occurred, 
amongst those that profess to be God's people or God's chosen people. And it should open our eyes and, and cause us to realize that the wickedness is not so much outside in the world. We have to be on guard against what is inside. Uh, it's, it's not all out. It's like I said when the Lord first saved me and the church I was going to and they, they taught sound doctrine and everything. And I thought ever, you know, I knew there was other churches out there, but I thought ever Baptist church they all believe the same thing. They all practice the same thing. And so I started going to Bible college. And then I found out differently. And um, so sometimes we have, because our experience may be kind of limited and sheltered, there's nothing wrong with being sheltered from the evil in this world. But it sometimes limits our understanding of what is the reality that is out there and that we're dealing with sometimes. But Numbers 25. Verse 1 through 9. And Israel abode at Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And it goes on. So he talks about they committed fornication. But uh, we see that and they committed idolatry as a result of it. And that is one of the main reasons that got over and over stresses about marrying. And, and he, this carries over into the New Testament that a child of God who professes salvation ought not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever because what fellowship hath, you know, and he goes down through that list of, of illustrations showing that there's no compatibility there. You know, if a person is genuinely saved, there is no compatibility there because what ultimately happens is the same person, the child of God, will be led into uh, worldly behavior and, and led away from the Lord. And that is what happened here at, at Baal Peor, uh, or at Shittim, and they were joined to Baal Peor. Uh, said, neither let us tempt Christ. Let's jump back over here to our, our text and move on along here. Verse 9 said, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Now, how do we tempt Christ? You know, Paul says, or no, James says that God cannot be tempted with sin, neither tempteth he any man. What's he talking about here? It's not tempting so much to sin, but testing him. And we see this in Exodus 17. Verse 1 through 7, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? 
And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? Uh, they be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of all the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And that's the key. When he's talking about a tempted, and he said that not to tempt Christ. He said, is the Lord among us um, or not? You know, there are times when as God's people say, Lord, if you're really here, Lord, if, then do this. And it's almost like, you know, when people try to bargain with God. Say, you know, Lord, if, and, and, and so on. And it's that if. Is the Lord really among us or not? I mean, God had manifested His presence with them again, over and over again. And that's they were testing Him. They were testing His patience, too. You know, you, we use that phrase. Uh, Lou has one, says, you're on my last nerve. Uh, you know, you're testing my patience and it's just about run out. And, and that's the idea here about tempting the Lord or tempting Christ. It is testing Him, saying, if, if, are you really here? You know, are you really for us? Are, do you really love us? You know, we're, we're, it, it has to do with doubting the Lord. Uh, they accused God. And that was one of the things that as Satan, we talk about the temptation of Christ. And when Satan came to him, if thou be the Son of God, then demonstrate it for me. You know, there are times when people, they want to see some great demonstration of His presence in power, rather than just taking Him at His word. And of course, the last one we can all identify, neither murmur ye. No. And there are so many examples that it records of the children of Israel in the wilderness. They murmured and they complained. Those two kind of go to the idea of murmuring. It is that kind of talking under their breath. You know, not, it's not exactly a whisper. They're not really enunciating the words clearly. But they're talking under their breath in a complaint. You know, they murmur. Complaining about the things that God, you know, our lot in life, and oh, woe is me, and, and complaining about how God is running things. You know, we, we, talk, we say we believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe that all things work together for good. We believe that He's in control of all things. There's nothing that's happening or ever shall happen that He doesn't either directly cause or permit and allow to happen and that which He uh, allows to happen is going to work uh, uh, in, in harmony with that which He has purposed to bring to pass. We know that, but when we look around and things, what's happening around us, things are happening to us, we find ourselves in difficult situations, whatever, we begin to complain, we begin to murmur, and, and we don't like the way God is dealing with things. Well, notice in Philippians chapter 2, Again, looking for Philippians and wound up over in Timothy. 
Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And what Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. They may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But if you're going around murmuring and disputing all the time, uh, that's not going to reflect very favorably on the Lord. And so he said, do all things without murmurings and disputings. In Jude, we see a similar admonition. Jude verse 8. He said, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring up against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. But these speak evil evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beast in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. All these children of Israel there in the wilderness. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered, withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Um, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers and complainers work walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaketh great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. So he, he goes through this long list here, describing just the wickedness of those, he said, they speak out against, they, against uh, dignities, they, you know, and he said they're murmurers and complainers walking after their own lusts. All the things that he describes here, uh, and so he said, don't be murmurers, and that implies then complaining. These five examples of temptation are nothing new. Uh, back in our text in, in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for examples, in samples. And they are written for our admonition. Said so that that was written for us. It's recorded for our learning. What is it that we can learn from these things? He says, verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now, we need to be careful and never have the attitude, that will never happen to me. I'll never do that. We're in the flesh. And we are 
subjected to enticements and temptations all the time. And it talks about in the last days how evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so he's, he's warning us here, as in many other places, not to think more highly of ourselves than is appropriate, not to think that we're so strong that we don't need that admonition. We need to be, be careful. He said, take heed. Lest you fall. You think you're standing, but take heed. Lest you fall. Because he says, yeah, you, you made a profession of faith. You was baptized. You're a member of one of the Lord's churches. You know you're faithful in coming and all of this. And so are all of they. That's why they're examples to us. Now, verse 13, and, and this, how many times have, I know I have, how many other times have you heard verse 13 quoted without reference to what has just been said before? There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. This, uh, this was the context to that statement. Once such temptations are common to man. Take heed. And think you're standing. Let you fall. Because all of this is common. Others have been tempted and have fallen. He says, but God is faithful. Through all of that, God was faithful to His promise. And though that whole generation died in the wilderness, He brought their children and the children of Israel. Because that's talking about the descendants and all. It were the descendants, the children of Israel did enter the promised land. Just like God said He would. God has promised that He would perpetuate His church. And the church that Jesus built will be here functioning in this world when He returns. But there's no guarantee that this particular church will be. Or any other. Take heed. These things are common to man, but God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with... See, some people would want to stop right there. I, and I've heard people say, well, I know the Bible says he, he, he won't allow me to be tempted above I'm able to, to bear it. They say as they yield to the temptation. You know, it, it's, though it's God's fault. He, he put more on me than I could bear. No, he says, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. In other words, you have to be willing to look to him and listen to him and what is the escape that He has provided for you? Now, one of the things that it mentioned here uh, in those temptations was where He sent the fiery serpents among them. And they cried out, Take the serpents away! You know, and He didn't take the serpents away. See, that's a lot of people's idea of Providing a way of escape. You take it away. Then I won't be tempted anymore. Just take sin away. But what did he do? He told Moses, you make a serpent of brass, symbolizing God's judgment of, of sin. 
put it on a pole, and everybody that looks to that, when he's bitten, he looks to that and he'll live. There's the way that God provided. In the Gospel of John, Jesus applied that to himself. Because in him he became sin for us who knew no sin. God poured out his judgment for our sin on him. And all who look to him in faith will live. Jesus Christ is the way of escape that God has provided. We need to look to him. You know, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do it in my own self. I can't do it, you know, and that's one of the things when Paul was afflicted with a thorn in the flesh. And he doesn't say what it is, and I've said this before, I think that is so, that whatever, we can apply that to ourselves. We can identify with it whatever our thorn might be. So he didn't specify what it was, just that it was a thorn in the flesh to buffet him, and it was there to keep him humble because uh, God had blessed him with so much knowledge and, and revelation that it would have been easy for Paul to have gotten puffed up. In a way, that thorn was God's way of escape for him to avoid pride. There's, there's a temptation for you. And Paul had prayed and asked three times. You know, some people say, well, if you're really saved and you just ask the Lord, He'll do it. No, Paul, he said, if we pray according to His will. Paul was an apostle full of the Holy Spirit and he prayed three times and God's answer was no. Because I've done this for a reason and I'm not going to undo it. He said, but I'll tell you what, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul goes on then to elaborate upon that. He said, now, I, I, I glory in my infirmities because when I'm weak, when I understand, acknowledge my weakness and I turn to God for help and strength, then I find strength. I think that is part of the, what was behind his statement there in his letter to the Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is our way of escape. Whatever the temptation may be, whatever the thorn in the flesh, whatever the circumstances may be, we will be able to bear it if we look to Christ and look to Him for strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, not in yourself, but in the Lord. There's nothing in that that we can boast in because it is not our strength. Uh, and so we see His words here and maybe help us to understand better what He's saying when He said, Now there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And he gave us some examples of temptations that the children of Israel went through. And there's not a thing there that occurred to those people that's not common to God's people today. And if we would uh, bear up under those trials and testings that come in our life, then we must look to Christ. And we look to Him and we, you know, find that strength. You know, what, it, it was a blessing, I believe. Paul, the way he expressed that when the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. When Paul experienced that grace, it was such a blessing. It was, he enjoyed more of a blessing through God's strengthening him than he would have if God had merely taken it away. God knows what's best for us. And He does what's best for us. And we need to learn to trust Him and look to Him. And the Bible talks about the trying of your faith being more precious than gold tried in the fire. The testing of our faith, the trying of our faith, when God puts 
us into situations that in our own strength we cannot deal with. And we, he's teaching us to look to him. You know, and like any good teacher, he doesn't give it to you all at once. You know, he'll give you a little bit and he'll strengthen you. You know, you'll learn from that. And then he'll give you a little bit more. That is, in other words, the trial gets a little, a little heavier, a little more difficult. You know, when, when you start the first grade, they don't give you a college exam. They give you test that's age appropriate. And we was talking about the maturing and growing as a Christian uh, this morning. And the trials and testings that God gives us is the same. It's kind of age appropriate to our level of maturity, but it's there to encourage us to grow and to mature in the Lord. And when we've gone through it, he says it's much more precious than that of gold that has been refined. He talks about gold, uses that as an example because gold many times will have impurities in it. There will be bits of ore and dirt and things, but you put it in the fire and smelt it and melt it down and separate those impurities out, then the gold comes out pure. Still gold, but it's pure because those uh, impurities have been purged out, and that's what God is doing in our lives. He's purifying us. And that's a, a term that he uses. He's purifying us, refining us, that we might shine forth. And so he's just getting us ready and preparing us for his return, uh, and which I believe is very close upon us. So instead of murmuring or complaining, instead of arguing with the Lord, any of these things, let us look to Christ who strengthens us and enables us and that we might grow in Him and rejoice in the blessings that He bestows upon us. You know, Job went through, and I have no desire whatsoever to ever go through the things that Job went through. But it says, God blessed him. The latter end of Job was greater than in the beginning. God blessed him with twice what he had, what he lost. God always blesses when he tries us and tests us and we come through, we look to him and he strengthens us. What we receive as a result of that will be better than anything we had before. So let us rejoice in that and learn from these things and always look to the Lord when, when things come upon us, look to Him and live. Let us stand together.